hey everyone, this is Mr. David. Thanks for submitting all your work on the New Deal. I look forward to reading those responses. Today, what we're going to do is we'll look at World War II and we'll get all the way to the U.S.'s entrance into World War II in late 1941. And so we'll kind of assess the causes and all that kind of stuff going on. And then Thursday, we'll wrap it up, talk about World War II on the home front and kind of the participation of the United States in the fighting and, and all that kind of stuff. This Friday, AP is going to officially announce what the AP exam is going to look like for U.S. history. So what exactly is the question or are the questions that are going to be asked? So based on what they say there, that will largely indicate some of the work that we're going to do over uh, the Easter break. If you recall, when we were in school... The original plan over Easter break was to do a lot of reading on the Cold War chapters and the Civil Rights Movement chapters. Well, that's going to be postponed because, if you recall, on the AP exam this year, it's only going to go up to World War II. So actually, by the end of this week, we'll technically be done with the content, but we need to refresh and we need to make sure we're ready to go uh, for the AP exam. Before we get started specifically on um, World War II and the United States, I want to remind you or introduce you to some of our major characters. This is U.S. history, but at the same time, we need to kind of look at the war through a world history lens as well. So if you recall, the leader of Italy is this man here, Benito Mussolini the newspaper editor who was able to really appeal to the masses of Italy who felt betrayed by the Treaty of Versailles, felt as though they had been wronged even though they were on the winning side, so he will be their major leader, and fascist dictator, and at least initially on, one of his big allies is going to be probably the biggest villain in all of history, Definitely the 20th century, Adolf Hitler, who will come to power in Germany in 1933. And even though the Axis powers of World War II are Italy, Germany, and Japan, it's really Germany that's our main Axis power. And it's really the growth of Nazi Germany that is going to scare the United States and the rest of the world. So, something that we want to always think about there. Failed artist became popular and similar to Italy, able to really appeal to the German masses because of the hatred of the Treaty of Versailles. This is Emperor Hirohito. He's going to be the Emperor of Japan throughout World War II, taking office in 1930. And what's really interesting is that when the war ends, a lot of the people that were the major kind of commanders or leaders of these wartime countries are going to either be killed or if they're still alive, they will be put on trial for their war crimes. Hirohito actually does not, and he will serve as uh, the emperor of Japan up to his death in the 1980s, and the reason why, or at least one of the reasons why, is because he is going to deflect blame on the military, which had realistically kind of taken over Japan, and we'll see that as we run through this, uh, but still today, relatively controversial, as again, he's largely excused from all the atrocities that Japan committed in World War II, and blame was instead put on major military leaders. And this one, probably the most famous, uh, Tojo. He was the head of the military throughout the 1930s. And then when war started, he became the head of war in Japan. And then he actually became the prime minister uh, later on. And then once war ended, he was put on trial and killed. Also remember our another big uh, totalitarian leader, during World War II, who's Stalin, who becomes head of the Soviet Union about 1927. And 
when Russia became communist, the United States, if you remember, was very fearful. This is why we had the first Red Scare in the early 1920s. However, throughout World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union will become closer. And the reason has to do basically with both having the common enemy of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. And then once war ends, those relations will become even worse between the United States and the Soviet Union. But at least for a time, there will be some mending of relations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Okay, when we talk about Britain, who will be the U.S.'s major ally in World War II, we want to talk about a few different people. The first is uh, our British Prime Minister at the beginning part of the war, Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain was an advocate of appeasement, and so we'll look at this a little bit more, but the idea here that the only way to slow Hitler was to basically give him what he wanted, and then hopefully he would settle down. Um, appeasement was a failed policy, but at the time, some, especially Chamberlain, believed that that was the best way to deal with Nazi Germany and Hitler. And the biggest opponent of appeasement will be Winston Churchill. When war starts and it's clear that Hitler will stop at nothing, the British people will lose confidence in Chamberlain, and their new prime minister will be Winston Churchill, who very much kind of a hero throughout uh, British history, especially because of the way he stood up to Hitler, refused to surrender, and really united the British people in a time of great misery throughout the war. And then the last person is someone we're very familiar with, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, U.S. president taking office in 1933, and will be our president throughout early U.S. involvement, not in war, and then once the United States actually gets into war. And so I want to remind you of some of these characters, because as we go through and kind of tell the story of World War II, we'll be referencing some of these people back and forth. So just a quick little reminder as to what we're dealing with. So last week, we talked all about the Great Depression, this terrible thing that had hit the United States. And as all that's going on, there is going to be major, major problems abroad. And one of the things that you want to realize is that for as bad as the Great Depression is for the United States, it's also going to be really, really bad for other countries, especially because a lot of countries had not recovered from World War I, still in disarray, still in disrepair, and now the Great Depression is going to hit, and it's going to hit them even harder dealing with unemployment, dealing with other things like that. A place that we definitely are going to see a lot of issues for the Great Depression is going to be Japan. And basically what's going to happen is by the early 1930 period, the military will basically effectively take over Japan. And even though we have Emperor Hirohito and a functioning government, the reality is it's the military that's making the decisions. Our first major conflict is going to occur in 1931, when Japan decides to invade Manchuria, which is a part of China. And there's going to be a lot of outrage over this aggression, and including from the United States, but from other countries throughout the world. This is a serious problem. This is also a violation of the League of Nations, which Japan was a part of, and China was a part of as well. So the League of Nations is going to have to respond to this, because... There's been a serious issue that's happened, and the response by the League of Nations is extremely weak, basically telling Japan to stop. No real enforcement, no real harsh measures or anything like that, and of course, as you might guess, Japan is basically going to totally ignore it, and they will stay in Manchuria. The United States, not a part of the League of Nations, they will respond with their own response named the Stimson Doctrine, named after the Secretary of State that came up with this response. And his response was basically that the United States would not recognize this expansion. Once again, stupid. This does not provide any enforcement. This does not take a hard hit on Japan. And instead... Japan will continue 
to expand further into China, more attacks there, and then even moving themselves into the Pacifics and taking over islands and things like that over there. Um, the League of Nations will continue to put some pressure on Japan. Hey, stop, you know, don't do that, you know, whatever. And Japan just finally decides in 1933 to leave the League. And so, again, we talked about this when we got to the end of World War I. The League of Nations is very weak. It's not very powerful. And we will see this kind of continuing on through a few specific incidences where the whole point of the League was to prevent these kind of things from happening and instead... They're so weak that they can. Also remember, the League is always going to have issues because the United States, this very powerful, rich country, never becomes a part of it. So that will also uh, severely kind of handicap the League from being super effective. Here, by the way, is a look at Japan, and this is really going to be throughout the entirety of the 1930s. Japan just getting there a little bit quicker than the other groups. But basically, all the treaties that had been signed, all the agreements that were about limiting arms and not building up huge navies, even you see here the Calabrian Pact that was supposed to outlaw war, Japan is going to basically discredit all of that as their military will dictate basically all of Japan's uh, domestic and foreign policy. Here we see a look here, and this is kind of what we see Japan, China fighting, League of Nations not doing anything about it, kind of pointing at the United States to take care of it. United States not really interested. That was one of the reasons why they decided not to be involved in this to begin with. If you recall, throughout the 1920s, the United States had reverted to isolationism, and as all this is going to be going on abroad, that's going to be kind of the approach of the United States, take care of themselves. We see this evidence in actually an economic conference dealing with the Great Depression, the London Economic Conference in 1933. And this conference was set up, 66 nations set to um, attend in order to try to come up with an international response to the Great Depression. A lot of this had to do with stabilizing basically exchange rates so foreign trade could happen more easily. Well, if you recall, FDR was doing various things with the gold standard and other inflationary policies to benefit people in the United States. And so because of that, he is not going to have the U.S. be a part of this conference. And kind of this approach of everybody for themselves is going to be largely what the United States is going to be doing as they kind of focus on their own internal dealings as opposed to the dealings going on throughout the world. Another thing that we're going to see throughout the 30s is the United States is going to try to make a decision that they need to get rid of a lot of their overseas commitments. And in particular, one of the biggest ones we're going to see is the Tidings and Act in 1934. This will pave the way for the Philippines actually to finally get their independence in 1946. What this was doing was setting up basically um, the U.S.'s transition out so the Filipinos could go to self-government and stuff like that. It's important to realize that this is not necessarily something done totally on a moral basis or human rights basis or anything like that. The United States had largely gotten sick of the Philippines. It had become a lot of work to deal with and stuff. So this was just kind of a way for them to back away get rid of the area, but then before they actually did, putting themselves in a spot where they were able to have beneficial economic relations uh, still remaining, as well as uh, naval bases, so uh, not always the greatest thing. As far as Latin America is concerned, FDR will start something that was actually started by Hoover, which is going to be the good neighbor policy. And this is what it sounds like, which is basically the United States seeing themselves as needing to be a better neighbor to Latin America instead of taking advantage um, of them as they had before in the past. It's with this that we'll actually see the U.S. make good on their promise of being a good neighbor by withdrawing troops in Haiti as well as Nicaragua. And we'll also see... 
Cuba's Platt Amendment officially ended. The one exception being that the United States is able to keep the naval base on Guantanamo Bay. But the really, pr probably the toughest part of the Platt Amendment, which was the right of the U.S. to intervene at any point in time, as well as the inability of Cuba to sign any foreign treaties, will be eliminated. So this is a big, big thing that's going to really show a different side of the United States. The United States is also going to do something that's kind of atypical of them, which is that they're going to officially recognize the Soviet Union as a legitimate country in 1933. Soviet Union had really been established far before that uh, with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Um, and the United States had been slow to actually recognize, but they do so in 1933, hope for better trade with Soviet Russia, also in the hopes of kind of being a counterweight to the growth of Germany and Hitler, as well as the growth of Japan and Asia. So that's something that, again, is, is kind of a little bit different. But once again, the United States kind of focusing on their own interests um, b before really anyone else's. This, by the way, um, a poster for the Good Neighbor Policy, Understanding Our Southern Neighbors. And then this actually a picture of FDR and President Vargas of Brazil. FDR actually makes a visit to Latin America. And so we see a different side of this. And not to say the good neighbor policy is like the best ever. But at the same time, it really does help improve relations which originally were so poor between the two sides. As far as trying to deal with foreign trade... What instead FDR sets up are reciprocal trade agreements. These are established in 1934, aimed at both relief and recovery. And if you recall, right after the Depression hit, Hoover had passed the Holly Smoot tariff, and what this had done was raise tariff rates to in the 60%, very, very high, making foreign trade basically impossible. And if you recall, other countries raised their tariffs in response. So what you had was something that was really not beneficial for anyone. So these reciprocal trade agreements that are going to be set up are going to be done where tariff rates could be lowered up to 50% on items. So that's obviously a huge, huge reduction. However, they could only be lowered if the other country followed suit. So reciprocal. You see, you know, I'll do it, you do it. All right, so this is what's going to be set up in order to make trade much more accessible in our foreign markets. By 1939, 21 countries had come up with reciprocal trade agreements with the United States, leading to an increase in foreign trade, also significant for ending the high tariff policy that had been really so prominent in the United States for really the majority of its history, but especially since the Civil War, we never really saw those tariffs decrease, so this is going to be a big step in changing the tariff policy. This is also going to really, really help in uh, promoting international trade post-World War II as international trade will become at its highest after this point in time. So a big, big step. And again, the United States doing this in order to ease those kind of foreign trade um, barriers that had been so problematic. And special interests, not going to like this. We know that they have been able to make the tariff rate high in the United States. FDR says no more. This, by the way, we would talk a lot about tariffs in this class, and if you look, this is a look at average tariff rates in the United States, and you can see how high it had been really following the Civil War in the 1860s into the 1870s, really, really high. Um, we saw it take a dip during Wilson's presidency, if you recall, but then right back up. Um, and then again, really reaching a peak with Holly Smoot, and then all of a sudden we can see those reductions happening um, into the 30s and 40s, and that's going to be really a big deal that's going to help out with promoting foreign trade. Okay, a lot of trouble brewing overseas as we talk about the conflicts in Europe, Asia, etc. So what exactly is that look like? 
Well, going back to those guys that I showed you at the very beginning of class, totalitarianism and total and complete rule is really going to become very popular throughout the 30s. And a lot of this has to do, by the way, with the trouble brought on from the Great Depression and after World War I. People were looking for somebody to take control. People were looking for someone with the answers. And many of these people, such as Hitler, such as Mussolini, were able to play on the people's fear in order to grow in their own power. So Stalin, for example, our major communist leader of the Soviet Union, he always went after people that were opposed to him, but his biggest show of silencing people came in 1936 through the Great Purge. Millions and millions murdered, including communists. Also, many sent to exile in the labor camps of the cold frigidness of Siberia. Not something you'd want to be a part of. Mussolini, Il Duce in Italy, he wanted to make Italy a world power, so what he's going to do is take over really one of the only places in Africa that was not imperialized, and that was Ethiopia. Once again, this is a violation of the League of Nations. This is an act of aggression when he does this in 1935. League once again responds pathetically, and it's really at this point after this that the League will be effectively dead. It will still exist, but between Manchuria and between Ethiopia, the fact that they are able to do nothing shows just what a weak entity this was. Hitler is our worst offender as he continues to violate the Treaty of Versailles. So when Hitler took office in 1933, he basically immediately stopped paying the reparations that Germany owed, but it will get worse as he completely withdraws from the League of Nations. He rearms, that again was another violation here as well, as he continues to grow the um, Air Force, which they weren't actually supposed to have. He makes conscription mandatory, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then what we're going to see, which is very, very scary, is that Germany and Italy will combine in 1936 to form an alliance, and this is known as the Rome-Berlin Axis. And so now what we have are basically the two scariest guys in Europe, the two most dangerous, and now they're in alliance with one another. Japan also continuing their aggression in the east as they continue to bomb China, attack China, things like that. This is not a pretty picture, and our world is looking increasingly unstable it's kind of a question, what is going to be done in order to try to stop these guys? Will the United States take a role? This, by the way, is a look. Again, a very aggressive attack that Mussolini undertakes to take over Ethiopia. Here, by the way, is a look at uh, German factories as they look to rearm. Again, not allowed, but that's going to be what Hitler really thinks it will be the future for Germany's greatness. So the United States is going to take an approach that really shouldn't have surprised us at this point. It's a similar approach to World War I, but actually it's a, it's a little different in that the U.S. will preach neutrality and will try to execute neutrality. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do a little bit later is I'm going to ask you to kind of do a timeline of the U.S.'s involvement into World War II. And what we want to show here is basically a few things. Number one, the changing attitude of the government. Number two, the changing attitude of FDR. And then number three, the changing attitude of the American people. And so I'll kind of hit at these as we progress through here. The United States wasn't oblivious to what was going on in Europe, right? They saw what Hitler was doing. They saw what Mussolini was doing. And they said, geez, these guys, they seem bad guys. Okay, we don't like dictators. You know, that's uh, against democracy, obviously, which is a cornerstone of the United States. This can't, you know, work itself like this. Okay, but the United States is also going to say we can't get involved. All right, we, we just can't be involved in what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Asia. It's just not our deal. 
Why is the United States not going to get involved initially in 1935 and be hesitant to get involved until much later? A few major things I want to share with you. Number one, don't forget, Great Depression is still going on throughout all of this. And obviously FDR wants to see the New Deal in action. He wants to see that relief, recovery, reform all taking place. And this would obviously take away from that from, uh, from happening. So the Great Depression is a major reason why the United States will really not want to involve themselves. Another thing that they're going to really look at is they're going to look at World War I and what they're going to refer to as the mistakes that they made. And again, if you recall, the United States had tried to stay out of World War I, but because they continued to trade with really only one side, the Allied side, then they got stuck into the war, whether they liked it or not. Also, by the 1930s, the American people had grown incredibly unfavorable about their decision to participate in World War I, and they're going to say, you know, we can't do that again. Okay, that was a mistake. We spent all this money. We loaned out all this money, which, by the way, the United States does not retrieve all of it. Say, we, we can't be doing this stuff anymore, okay? We need to go to doing our own things. We can't get involved here, whatever. So because of that, the United States will pass a variety of neutrality acts. And the major neutrality acts will be in 1935, 1936, 1937, and then 1939. And I'll get into that the last one in a little bit, but let me kind of explain what's going to kind of go on here. At least initially in 1935, 1936, and even in 1937, what U.S. neutrality says and the way these are worded is that the United States will not trade, will not be involved with any country who is considered to be belligerent. So what this means is any country involved in fighting um, or, or war and things like that. What this means, at least for a little bit, is the United States is not going to be trading on the water. Again, going back to the idea of the mistakes of World War I, they're not going to be on there because they don't want to risk their merchant ships being sunk. So what we have is a really kind of interesting dynamic, but we're really looking at the United States basically saying, hey, look, we can't be involved in this, okay? And the reality is if we only go to one side, you know, that's going to mess everything up. And so... We're going to see something really interesting here, which is that even though this is what the United States sees as being necessary to do in order to avoid war, it's not going to be all that great because what this means is that their allies, who are the democracies in Europe, you know, your Britain, your France, they're not going to get any assistance, at least initially, from the United States. In the same way that the enemies, your Hitler's, and your Mussolini's are not going to get assistance either. So this is problematic here uh, because it means that basically, you know, hate to put it this way, but the bad guys are going to be benefiting because the United States is not giving aid to Britain and to France. And you see here this criticism, by the way, this cartoon by Dr. Seuss, who actually did a lot of cartoons during World War II. And this is a criticism of the Neutrality Act this is the aid that will win. Okay, These are supplies. These are things that could aid in the war effort. And because of U.S. neutrality, um, that, that aid will not get there. One of the major reasons why this occurs is because the majority opinion in the United States is not to be involved in any foreign affairs, not to be involved in any foreign entanglements. And so we'll see that happening here also with these neutrality acts. Okay, so let's talk about some neutrality in action for the United States, at least early on. And one of the big ways in which we see the United States committing to their neutrality is in the Spanish Civil War. Just a little context behind the Spanish Civil War. Francisco Franco was the head of the rebels, and he is going to receive large aid and assistance from Mussolini and Hitler. The reason why is because of the fact that Number one, they did support Franco. Franco was a fascist like them. But the other thing is that Mussolini and Hitler kind of saw this as a dress rehearsal for World War II. They wanted to test out their new tanks and their new weapons and their new movement of men and things like that. And the Loyalist government, even though they'll receive some Soviet support, 
it will be nothing in comparison to the huge amount of aid and support given by Mussolini and Hitler to the rebels. Some Americans will hear about what was going on in Spain. They felt sympathy for the loyalists. And about 3,000 Americans will go to Spain to fight or volunteer. This is what we refer to as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Here are them here in this picture. But what you want to think about here is that the U.S. government does not give any support to the loyalists. And instead... Um, you know, the rebels will be able to take over. And it's one of those things, the United States so committed to not being involved here, what's going to happen is that they're going to inadvertently allow this rebel group and another fascist leader to take control in Spain. Throughout this early period also, the United States will not build up their armed forces uh, basically not even kind of preparing for a conflict at all. So it won't be until much later that the United States will move into preparing their military for an actual type of uh, big issue and problem. So it's really interesting to kind of see that the United States really did not want to be involved here at all. Okay, if we're kind of tracking the U.S.'s involvement and where things are going, we need to talk about what's going on in the East. Because in 1937, we're really going to see our first theater of World War II open up when Japan and China officially go into war, as Japan basically tries to take over the entirety of China. Now, FDR decides this is the first time where he's going to kind of bend the neutrality acts. And the reason why is because he refuses to consider this a f official war. And that's actually on purpose, because by refusing to do that, the Neutrality Acts technically do not apply. And so because of that, he's still able to trade weapons and supplies to China, which they very badly needed. But also, kind of interestingly, even though Japan will be basically the enemy... Uh, Japan is going to continue to buy war supplies from the United States in huge amounts also during this time. And remember, Japan's kind of a small island country. They're reliant on the U.S. and other countries, especially the U.S., for all the things they'll need to conduct war. Tanks, gasoline, steel, iron, all that kind of stuff. And the United States will be their major trading partner, at least for a while. In 1937, FDR, realizing that maybe a little bit more action might be necessary, will give a speech known as the quarantine speech. And basically what he's going to do say here is that, hey, maybe we need to do a little bit more in order to go after the aggressors, literally quarantine them. And he says maybe like economic embargoes or other types of things. Well, isolationists in the United States, which numbered quite a lot, especially in 1937, are going to be very angry with FDR's speech and very fearful that this kind of rhetoric is going to lead to involvement into the war. And so Roosevelt will kind of calm himself down. He's going to kind of go away from that. That actually is not going to happen in 1937. So, you know, felt the pressure enough that that's what's going to occur. Now, something interesting is going to happen. Japan is going to sink a U.S. ship, the Panay, and... If we think back to the War of 1898, we think back to World War I, a sinking of a U.S. ship oftentimes leads to war. No war here, all right? They're able to come to an agreement with the Japanese. Japanese apologize as well as pay for the damages. And it's like, for now, all's okay. So we're kind of seeing here that the United States, even as conflict kind of escalates, still committed to staying out here. And something that may have triggered war, you know, in a in a previous conflict does not. And so it's significant to kind of see that the United States really does not want to get involved in this, um, at least initially. The problem, though, besides for many things, is that Japan is going to continue to commit a lot of military atrocities against the Chinese. And so because of that, um, it's kind of like a moral pressure to get involved here as the Japanese military really was incredibly brutal and harsh. 
This, by the way, the start of the war between Japan and China in 1937. Here we see uh, some of the Japanese tanks coming into China. And this, by the way, is in the uh, city of Nanking, where the Japanese will uh, commit such war crimes that it's referred to as the Nanking Massacre or the Rape of Nanking, uh, literally coming in and decimating almost the entirety of the population just in, in, in severe cruelty. For as bad as things were in the East, in Europe, things will get more complicated and more challenging. And that has a lot to do basically with Hitler, who decides to really push the boundaries and try to get all the things that he wants. So, for example, the Rhineland, which you can see here on the map, on the border between them and France, was supposed to be militar demilitarized. He's going to move military into there, therefore remilitarizing the Rhineland. Does not face opposition when he does so. Basically going to see this as a green light to continue to not listen to the Treaty of Versailles. He's going to put together compulsory military service, all right, requiring German young German men to participate in the military. Again, this is not allowed. He's not supposed to be doing this, but it's showing us that he is committed to expansion and he's committed to conflict. He will then move himself into Austria in the early part of 1938. Austria was where he was from. He felt as though Austria was a part of Germany. So he's going to move in and take them over. Again, little to no resistance. And things get a little bit more complicated when he moves German troops into the Sutenland, which is a part of Czechoslovakia. And when he does this, this is a little more controversial. And things look like they might be going for crisis. Britain and France... They're going to be kind of deciding what to do here. And the decision basically is made of appeasement. And what this lends itself to is an agreement in 1938, September, known as the Munich Agreement, which effectively gives the Sutenland to Hitler and Germany. And the Munich Agreement so signed because the idea by Neville Chamberlain of Britain and other proponents of appeasement was, hey, if we give them a little bit, then they should be satisfied and they should be okay to go. And then they're going to sign this with Hitler and say, okay, now you're done. Okay, you've taken over Austria. You've taken over this area of Czechoslovakia. It's over. And six months later, Hitler will move troops into all of Czechoslovakia and take it over. And so we see the failures of appeasement here. And we see that Hitler's thirst and appetite for expansion and for conquest will not go away. At this point, it's pretty clear war is inevitable as both Britain and France say, hey, appeasement, not going to happen. Uh, we already tried that. You violated this. You know, it's not going to work itself out. Um, however, the United States still sitting on the sidelines. Okay, they're watching what's going on, but they still don't want to get themselves involved here. And so, again, kind of stick into what they were doing before show you some maps here so you can recall kind of how this expansion looks. So here's Germany, first place Hitler's going to move into is into the Rhineland. Then we see him move down into Austria, which you see in kind of that brown, gray thing, um, which is going to be the next place. And then you see the Sutland right on the German border with Czechoslovakia. And then here we see, by the way, this will be the picture that totally um, will just be so damning because we see Neville Chamberlain here on the left shaking the hand of Hitler. And again, this shows what appeasement was supposed to be. Hey, we'll give him this, then he'll calm himself down, whatever else. Not going to work. Here, by the way, we see the continued expansion as he moves himself into the rest of Czechoslovakia. And we can see here that the next place that he realistically would go to would be Poland. And again, people know that Hitler's planning to move into Poland. And Britain and France tell him very explicitly, hey, look, if you attack Poland, we're going to come in here. 
we're going to go to war with you. It's no, it's not going to work. Well, that does not worry Hitler. Hitler is set on war. Hitler is set on expansion. And so the last kind of piece of the puzzle here that's going to give Hitler really the green light is a non-aggression pact that he signs with the Soviets and with Stalin. And this does not mean that the Nazis and the Soviets are allies necessarily. What it basically just says is, hey, look, we're going to respect each other. We're not going to invade each other. And this gives basically Hitler the green light to go ahead and to move on with his expansion. And so he's going to move on September 1st, 1939 into Poland. And again, this isn't really world history, but just a reminder that the Germans participate in a type of fighting known as Blitzkrieg. This means lightning war. And this combines heavy, heavy, fast mobilization of tanks, of planes, and of troops. And so because of that, Poland is taken over by Hitler and the Nazis within three weeks. Okay, that quick. And the reality is uh, Britain and France didn't know it was going to be so fast, really not able to give Poland any type of aid. So this is problematic for them. The Allies are going to desperately need American supplies. All right, they are now fighting the war, all right, they, but they need those U.S. supplies. The United States, though, hesitant. Know that Britain and France are their allies, but do not want to get themselves in the same predicament that they did in World War I, where they did not plan to go to war, but they were largely dragged into war. So the United States in 1939 will pass another neutrality act. So they're still going to say, hey, we're neutral. Okay, we're neutral. But part of that neutrality act is known as cash and carry. And what this meant was that countries could buy American war supplies or American supplies, but they had to pay cash and they had to bring their own transportation to transport the supplies. And so that's really interesting because what that's doing is, number one, it means that no loans will be given out. So that was something that the United States had done a lot of in World War I. Said, no, no, we didn't get our loans paid back. Not doing that again. And then they're not risking their ships being sunk because they're requiring the European countries to come with their ships and to load the items themselves. It's really, really interesting. Britain and France, by the way, in control of the seas. So this policy is aimed specifically at them without necessarily saying so. But there's no way Germany would be able to bring their own transportation across the, the water. So it's kind of a mute point. Because of this policy, it's going to be really nice because Britain and France will be able to gain a lot of the necessary war supplies that they needed. And what's really interesting is that something like this, which is going to be war production of goods, is going to really help solve that unemployment problem that has been lingering on since the late 1920s, early 1930s. So I asked you to think about you know, the New Deal as a success or as a failure and definitely arguments for both. But one of the things we said is at the end of the day, the Great Depression just doesn't solve the New, sorry, the New Deal doesn't solve necessarily the Great Depression. And we see that really it is World War II and we'll get more into this next class, which is a total war that will really solve the Great Depression for the United States. This, by the way, are the German troops coming into Poland? Here, by the way, a look at Cash and Carry. Again, Dr. Seuss cartoon, all out aid to allies. Again, not quite there, but moving more towards the direction of helping the Allied powers. This, by the way, is a cartoon looking at the non aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin. What's really interesting is that actually Stalin and Hitler hated each other. Uh, Hitler was a big anti-communist, uh, thought communism was just horrible ideology and just couldn't believe that somebody would subscribe to it. Um, Stalin hated Hitler and his treatment of 
workers um, and things like that. And really, the two enter into this non-aggression pact not because they like each other, but just because of the fact that they need that protection, basically. And so what we'll see is that this will not last. But at least initially, it secures Germany on the east for them to be able to fight solely uh, for the rest of Europe. And now they don't have to deal with Stalin and the Soviet Union. 1939, the American people see what Hitler does so quickly in Poland. Causes them some worry, but not nearly that much. However, things go from bad to worse very, very quickly. It's a weird moment for nearly six months following the fall of Poland, known as the Phony War, where basically there is no fighting that takes place. And it's really odd because it's like, geez, Germany was just so aggressive and they took over Poland so fast and so quick. Like, what's going on and what's happening? Well, ends about six months with... April of 1940, when Hitler takes over Denmark and Norway, takes these places over Blitzkrieg, fast, quick, moves now west into Netherlands and Belgium, quick, and really the one that is going to really affect a lot of Americans is when they take over France in June of 1940. So less than a year since war started. Hitler has been able to take over everywhere he's wanted with no, basically, issues or problems. For the United States, it's one thing for, like, Belgium to fall, but for France to fall, which, if we think about it, was kind of the main military power in World War I, it's a big kind of blow for the United States, and it's a big kind of shock as, geez, this is a little more serious than we anticipated. What it also means is that the United States' main ally in Europe, Britain, is now basically by themselves having to fight alone. And so the United States still, though, not wanting to get involved here. However, what we're going to see here is the United States will increase military spending to $37 billion. And necessary as they prepare for what might be a war that they have to become involved in. The other thing that they're going to do is they're going to launch a draft during peacetime in September of 1940. This is the first peacetime draft in American history. Again, usually when we have a draft, it's during the actual war. But what we see here is the United States, especially FDR, realizing that if war does happen, the United States is going to need to be prepared. Here, by the way, is a look at Hitler and other Nazis as they march through Paris. This is a huge insult to the French. Um, but if you recall, you know, Hitler really blamed France for the problems bought, brought on by the Treaty of Versailles to Germany. Again, you see here the Nazi flags throughout France. And here's what we've seen thus far. Okay, we've seen Germany come in. We've seen them basically take over all of Central and Eastern Europe up to the Soviet Union. We see them move into France, and now the next place they're going to move into is Britain. Hitler will launch air attacks on Britain, and what's so disturbing about this, by the way, is that these are on major British cities. So this is a time during war, and this is what makes some of the fighting in World War II so much different, is that... Um, this is aimed at civilians. Okay, these are aimed at non-war uh, people, non-war cities, non-war factories, and so that's one of the kind of devastating effects of World War II: the amount of civilian casualties that take place. At this point, Chamberlain is no longer the Prime Minister of Britain. It is now Winston Churchill, who was the most ardent opponent against appeasement and basically refuses to surrender. And so what we're going to see is really Germany attacking London and the other major British cities every single day and every single night. Huge damage, huge, huge destruction, so many people killed. And Churchill says, no, we're, we refuse to surrender. It's really helpful that the Royal Air Force of Britain, which had been a lackluster force before this, really will defend very, very well. And actually very interesting, 
Hitler will kind of go away after a few months of attacking. And this is kind of the first time that he doesn't get what he wants. It doesn't mean he loses necessarily. It just means that he isn't really, you know, he just doesn't get exactly what he wanted here. And he is at least paused. When Britain is getting just bombed so heavily by Germany, there's much more sympathy within the United States and more people saying, hey, you know what? We got to help Britain out. Okay, but still not quite into the wartime. So what we'll see first is the United States will transfer over many destroyers that uh, Britain so desperately needed. These were left over from World War I, but still not necessarily involvement. And we're still looking at, you know, not wanting to repeat World War I mistakes and other things like that. But another thing that's going to start to happen are committees throughout the United States, which are known as the America First Committees. And these serve kind of a variety of different things. But one of the big things they're going to keep on stressing is that the United States should focus on themselves, focus on their own kind of stuff. And they're going to say, hey, look, if Britain is taken over, maybe Hitler is going to come over here to the United States. So we need to be prepared for that. And so once again, we still kind of see this hesitation of the United States to get involved. But you can see here how they're inching closer and closer uh, to getting themselves fully involved. Show you some pictures, by the way, from the bombings in Britain in 1940. Here, by the way, looking out for that tax. And this is brutal. This is the devastation that we see. Again, whole buildings destroyed, workplaces, homes. I mean, this is the effect that this war will have. And again, it's really our one of our only wars we've ever had where the majority of deaths and casualties are not combatants and not people fighting, but actually civilians. Here we see a look as, you know, the British people are strong and resilient as they do not allow Hitler and the Germans to, to, to hurt their spirits. And that has a lot to do with Winston Churchill that you see here and his ability to unite the British people, his ability to speak to them and tell them, we're going to make it. Okay, We're not going to allow this guy uh, to take advantage of us. And this, by the way, is a look at the inside of an underground uh, subway station in London. And when they can anticipate the, t the attacks, this is actually where they will go in order to kind of wait for the attack to stop underground. Um, and again, brutal. I mean, brutal, brutal stuff. Okay, amidst all this, it's time for a presidential election. It is 1940. And the Republicans are going to put up a guy, Wendell Wilkie from... Indiana. And this guy, very personable, very charming. The people liked him, but was a political novice, was an attorney that basically had no political experience. And the Republicans were kind of deadlocked at their convention. And he kind of comes out of the woodwork and they decide, hey, you know what? This is a good compromise candidate for the two sides. Yeah, he doesn't have much political experience, but he's very popular. This might be the guy that is able to unify the Republicans in order to defeat the Democrats. FDR will make a historic decision in 1940, which is to break the two-term tradition that had been the norm since George Washington. And the idea being that he needed to continue what had been started and the need for his experience in these kind of turbulent times. On the campaign trail, Wilkie makes many, many speeches, hundreds throughout the entire country. He criticizes FDR primarily by calling him a dictator. He was more so opposed to FDR for his New Deal stuff. Actually, as far as his war things, they were pretty similar in both wanting to stay out of the war but continue to provide U.S. aid to the Allies and things like that. Well, FDR is not going to campaign much at all in 1940 because of how busy he was with everything going on foreign policy-wise, war-wise, and all the rest of these type of things. FDR will win in 1940, historic as this becomes his third term, something that had been, again, not something that had happened. Uh, because of the traditions of the two terms, but 
again, why is he elected? Well, the American people kind of feel that if war does happen, which seems much more likely in 1940 than it did, for example, in 1935, they're looking for somebody that can bring that experience. Wilkie right here. And here, by the way, is a look. Um, again, 55% for the popular vote. And then we see the Electoral College even more so in FDR's favor. So, again, it's not very close. And even though this is something that's very non, uh, not typical, it's something that the Americans feel like they need here. As 1940 goes and Hitler has been very successful, there's a decision in the United States that more needs to be done. And that cash and carry has worked as a effective policy, but it just is running out of time. And the reason why is because Britain is running out of cash. They also do not have the ships necessary to be going back and forth to transport supplies. So in order to accommodate this, the United States will pass what's known as the Lend-Lease Act in 1941. What this does, which is very interesting, is it says basically here that the United States will give weapons, give arms to victims of aggression, and that the reason why it's called Lend-Lease is because these countries could return the weapons and return the arms afterwards. Um, well, again, that's not really legitimate. Okay, who wants like a used tank after it's been used for war? But nonetheless, this kind of eases some of the fears of the isolationists who still didn't necessarily want the United States full-blown into this. This act is the most that the United States is going to take up to this point as it really does not allow for neutrality as it explicitly gives aid to the allies and to, again, the victims of aggression and those countries vital to the defenses of the United States. It also is really an economic declaration of war uh, more than anything else because of the huge, huge amounts of equipment that are going to be lent here, about $50 billion worth of equipment. Um, This will risk war, uh, but was seen as necessary in order to make sure Britain was taken care of. Another thing is that this will lead to all-out war production as trade will increase and, again, demand increases here as well. And the United States inches closer and closer, especially as they will help convoy, so literally assist British ships across the Atlantic. So once they do that, then obviously U.S. ships will be sunk by the Germans. Doesn't drag them into war yet, but we're seeing repeats, okay? We're getting closer and closer as we're seeing a lot of things happening that kind of happened before here. U.S. tanks, by the way, arriving here in Europe. Here, by the way, look at some of the things that are going to be happening through Lend-Lease. Um, and, again, it's mostly military equipment. And by the way, 11 billion up to 1943, about 50 billion by 1945. And again, basically, by the time we get to lend lease, we're about as close to war as we can be without being in an actual war. One of the things that the United States will also be involved in is something known as the Atlantic Charter. But a couple other things that I want to share with you. In June of 1941, Hitler makes probably his biggest mistake when he decides to invade the Soviet Union, therefore voiding that Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. And when he does this, very stupid, because now his border is not secure on the east, and the United States will start to aid the Soviets, and the Soviets will become an ally of Britain and the United States. And again, that wasn't necessarily the intention, but it's what's going to happen as a result of this. Churchill and FDR will meet secretly in August of 1941. So this is before the U.S. is totally in the war. And what they come up with is known as the Atlantic Charter. And this Atlantic Charter is going to outline what they want the world to look like after the war is over. And instead of the rights of nations, they're going to talk about the rights of individuals. 
and this will lend itself to major human rights um, advances after a uh, war is completed. They're also going to really talk about self-determination will also be significant as uh, the European and uh, countries will largely lose all their colonies after the wartime. And what they're also going to look at is uh, uh, allowing the people to return back to their governments that had been abolished by the dictators. So for the Germans or the Italians or something like that. Um, this Atlantic Charter also talks about a new type of general uh, collective security. So a new and better League of Nations. So it's basically trying to hit on a lot of the stuff that was hit on before World War um, Two had started and a lot of the problems that had happened after World War One that just weren't really effectively dealt with with the previous League of Nations. And these are all ideas in order to kind of make the world a better place. Here, by the way, we see FDR, Churchill will become very, very strong friends and strong allies uh, throughout the wartime. Okay, for as much as things were going on just crazy in Europe, what will actually spark the official U.S. entrance of uh, war is going to be actually something occurring in the East with tensions with Japan. So first off, remember that since 1937, Japan had been at all-out war against China, and the Japanese incredibly dependent on U.S. supplies, oil especially, but also steel, iron, all the things you need to conduct war. Very unpopular in the United States, but FDR was cautious about imposing a full embargo until late 1940 when a mild embargo will go into place on some Japanese-bound supplies. And then by 1941, a full embargo of U.S. supplies to Japan. And again, this is really a desperate situation as the Japanese are relying on those supplies in order to fight war. The big one they need is oil, U.S. oil. You can think about why. They have tanks, they have planes, all these things need oil in order to operate. The Japanese try to negotiate with the United States in order for the embargo to be lifted. The United States basically tells them the only way they'll do it is if the Japanese withdraw from China. Japan not interested, and so these negotiations fail. At this point, Japan sees the United States as an enemy and are basically set on war. And here's an article from the New York Times about this full-scale full embargo and how Japanese assets in the U.S. and Britain were frozen. And here's a look here at the U.S. cutting off the Japanese uh, oil, the oil to Japanese and other supplies. We'll conclude here with what is the immediate cause of the United States' entrance into war, and that is the attack on Pearl Harbor. After these negotiations fail, the U.S. knows that Japan is looking to attack, but they are not expecting the attack that comes on December 7, 1941, which is a surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And this is very secretive. The Japanese turn off all radio communications. It also occurs on a Sunday, which is, you know, a off day for most of our military personnel. So totally caught off guard by this. And about just under 3,000 casualties before 9-11. This was the uh, worst attack on U.S. soil. So really devastating that occurs here. FDR will address the people that day, he'll say this is a day that will live in infamy, and on December 8th, Congress will declare war on Japan uh, almost unanimously. By December 11th, Germany and Italy had declared war against the United States because they were in alliance with Japan, and what hopefully you realize from today is that Pearl Harbor was the final straw. All right. So even though that's what officially led into the wartime, we see here that especially because of really things going on in Europe, the U.S. was pulling themselves closer and closer until finally the 
Pearl Harbor attack hit, and that's when war was totally inevitable. Japan may have thought they were crushing the morale and supplies and military capability of the United States through this attack. Well, in actuality, it will be something that, like Pearl Harbor that will unify the American people towards war in a way in which if you didn't have it, it would have been really hard for that to actually occur. So really kind of an interesting development that's going to take place here. Let me show you some pictures from Pearl Harbor. Many, by the way, U.S. battleships destroyed. 